Welcome to The Big L, your unofficial source for Libertarian Party news, arcana, and information for the liberty-minded political junkie. Find us at BigLPodcast.com. Here's your host, Libertarian Party insider and the pink flame of liberty, Karen Ann Harlos. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Big L Podcast. I am so glad to be spending this time with you again. And this is part two of an episode from last time as a brief recap. Last episode, we spoke about how the very heart and soul of the Libertarian Party is defined nearly unchangeably by its statement of principles and that this was the very purposeful intent from its founding. We went through how there had been attempts to get around this and the events of last national convention in 2018 that hopefully hope does spring eternal should put an end to at least those particular reindeer games and so now we find ourselves back at the party's founding in 1971 through 1972 These founders, spurred on by D. Frank Robinson and Ed Carlson, with the blessing of David Nolan, purposed to embed a depth charge, a booby trap, a self-destruct mechanism into the party. Thank you for pressing the self-destruct button. By anchoring its principles to its proverbial jugular vein by requiring that these principles could only be amended with a super, super majority and a super, super quorum with a one shot chance to amend at the less lesser vote to the more standard vote of two thirds of delegates present in 1974 after they had two years to think about this crazy thing that they were doing. All right, we are now caught up, so let's go back and join our forebears in 1972. The initial LP platform committee, chaired by Pip Boyles, and I do believe he was one of the original people around that dining room table, that legendary dining room table that that spawned the Libertarian Party. So Pip Boyles and the rest of the committee set to work writing this statement. Originally, it had the alternate name of a preamble intermittently through that time, though they always intended to rename it to the Statement of Principles. And this initial result was deemed to be unsatisfactory. Not in its substantial content, but in its style, with all the hallmarks of a document written by committee. I think we've all seen those humorous diagrams. It had all of the charm of a Xerox instruction manual. Proposal, Jennifer. Proposal. I propose a subcommittee to deal with these matters and related issues. Do I have a second to that motion? Motion accepted. Thus, it was recommended that submissions be taken from a group to submit four proposals in addition to the one written by the committee, which would be considered by the delegates. As an aside, there was a bit of a hullabaloo last convention about the issue of multiple minority reports. And I do note at this convention that these alternate statement of principles were taken up as substantially minority reports. So nothing new. And the acceptance of multiple minority reports then is well within the tradition of the party. During the debate on the order of adoption, meaning Do the delegates adopt a statement of principles first or platform planks first? Several insightful comments were made arguing that any planks must be dominated by an underlying philosophy and principles and that such statement must be made its center. And with this in mind, Tony Nathan made this following plea. Now, before we get to 
this recording by Tony Nathan, which I cleaned up the best I could. This is a voice from the past, from the 1972 convention. Amazing that we have it. But if you do not know who Tony Nathan is, she was our very first vice presidential nominate and nominant. Is that like a catechumen? Our very first pre- vice presidential nominee. And she was the first woman to ever obtain an electoral college vote. So the Libertarian Party did, in fact, make history. And here is Tony Nathan. I just love her spunk and her voice. The of the whole nation, we adopt the plan for our So it was determined that the delegates would consider... The five proposals, the five alternates for the statement of principles, and these five proposals, to my knowledge, hadn't been read or heard until last year when I transcribed that portion of the 1972 audio tapes of that convention that were kept all of these years in the basement of D. Frank Robinson. The quality obviously did not stand up after nearly 50 years, and this was one of those reel-to-reel tapes and 1970s technology to begin with. And from what I understand, the recording machine was like off in this strange corner of the room. You know, the it wasn't really entirely well planned, but it is an absolutely amazing treasure that we even have this. And yes, I have listened to all of it. And D. Frank had almost all of the 1974 recordings as well, but heartbreakingly did not have one critical portion of them that we'll talk about in a bit. And it is in these proposals for the Statement of Principles that the early Randian influence was heard loud and clear. And I thank the libertarian gods daily that we did not adopt some of the other proposals, which were, quite frankly, exercises in tedium and stilted language, a la John Galt's speech. And I'm not even sure something that long can be called a speech. It was more like a filibuster in novel form in Atlas Shrugged. For example, just take a listen to this. I'm not going to play you the recording. I'm going to read to you some choice tidbits from some of the contenders for the Statement of Principles. And you will hear Ayn Rand come through loud and clear. So uh, let me just read some of them. The moral sanction to an action in a social context is a right. Man has no automatic conceptual knowledge of what his nature and needs are, and his life depends upon his freedom to acquire this knowledge and to act in accordance with his own judgment. Since this is true, it follows that each man has the right to interact with other men only by mutual consent and does not possess the right to start the use of physical force in any form against another man. Man is not a sacrificial animal. We hold that man has the right to act in his own self-interest and that no man can seek to benefit himself by using the force against other men. Did I say using the force? Right, so if you've come to this video... You're clearly interested in learning to use the force. I'm not going to edit that. That is hilarious. Uh, No man has the right to the use or disposal of the productive effort of another man, but each man has the right to own, use, and dispose of the product of his own efforts as he sees fit in order to exercise his own life. And I am still cracking up that I said no man can seek to benefit himself by using the force. Yes. And here's some more from one of the other contenders. And this is a different one. Okay. That was all from one. Here's from another. Let me take a sip of my diet Mountain Dew. I'm going to need some caffeine for this. We base our political philosophy on man's nature and his relationship to life. Man is distinguished by the possession of reason, which is his basic need for survival. To the extent an individual abandons reason in favor of authority, position, or emotion, he is his own destroyer. A right is a moral sanction of an individual's freedom to act 
voluntarily without coercion for his own goals. The right to life is the source of all rights, and the right to property is its only implementation. The right to property is the right to act, not to possess an object. Individual rights are the necessary condition for a society appropriate for human beings. The mind does not work under compulsion. Force a man to submit or to act against his own judgment will, in fact, paralyze the capacity for reason. Wow. You know, while all of that is certainly true, it isn't necessarily poetry and it doesn't roll off the tongue. Yes. Thank you, libertarian gods. Now, as an aside, I will note that the specific advocacy for capitalism explicitly named was present in every submission that mentioned an economic system. Do not buy for a second the revisionism that we were not founded on capitalism. It is absurd. Equally absurd is any idea that the non-aggression principle was not the core of the party. This was stated explicitly, and it was also explicitly stated that this was an ethical, moral position. In other words, a deontological position and not a utilitarian one. Climbing off my unexpected soapbox. So, After all of that, it was the proposal by John Hospers that was passed. Now, John Hospers was our first presidential candidate, the running mate to the aforementioned Tony Nathan. And John Hospers also had such a wonderful speaking voice. And I have to tell you, and you will think I'm a bit goony or cheesy and you know, like I care. But when, when these tapes were, well, electronified, right? But by D. Frank, and I finally got them in my hands and I sat and I listened to them and and I'm listening to the debate and I'm listening to these proposals. And then John Hospers gets to the mic and I hear his wonderful voice. We the members of the Libertarian Party challenged the cult of the omnipotent state. It was cutting through the mists of history. And no matter how goofy you may think I am, I cried. I did. I got weepy. I was cutting some onions, right? And I'd like you to hear this. And it, it's, it's okay to cry if, if you want to. But, it, but if you don't, that's okay, too. We, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of eminence of state and defend the rights of individuals. We hold that each individual has the right to exercise sole dominion over his own life and the right to live his life in whatever manner he chooses as long as he does not forcibly interfere with the equal rights of others to live their lives in whatever manner they choose. Governments throughout the world have regularly operated on the opposite principle, that the state has the right to dispose of the lives of individuals and the fruits of their labor. Even within the United States, these government is less totalitarian than most others, all political parties, other than our own, grant to the government the right to regulate the life of the individual and seize the fruits of his labor without his consent. We, on the contrary, deny the right of any government to do these things and hold that the sole function of government is the protection of the rights of individuals, namely, one, the right to life, and accordingly we support legislation prohibiting the initiation of force against others, such as killing, maiming, injuring, and all forms of physical assault on life and limb. Two, the right of liberty of speech and action, and accordingly we oppose all attempts by government to abridge the freedom of speech and press, as well as government censorship in any form. And three, the right to property. And accordingly, we oppose all government interference with private property, such as confiscation, nationalization, and eminent domain, and support legislation which prohibits robbery, trespass, fraud, and misrepresentation. 
since government has only one legitimate function, the protection of individual rights, we oppose any encroachment by government into the areas of voluntary or contractual relations among individuals. Men should be left free by government to deal with one another as free traders on a free market. The consequence is the only economic system compatible with men's rights is monthly fair capitalism. So, after this Hospers proposal was passed, per the bylaws, the delegates gave the party two years to reconsider. After the next convention in 1974, they could soften the principles or they could even scrap them altogether and start over. This is the test. What did they do? Did they soften them? Did they, did they do any of these possibilities that, you know, we might think they would do? No. They made the principles even more radical, as it were. And a bit more background about these formative years between 1972 and 1974 is in order. I'm going to tell you something unbelievable. I know you will find it very difficult to believe. It's This doesn't happen today. Divisions and factions were forming in the party. I know. Don't be shocked. It was, in fact, happening. Well, they were forming. And it, that at that time, it was between the majority minarchist and Randian factions and the minority anarchist faction. And this division, this rivalry, these arguments, which are silly arguments, which, which I'll get into in another podcast, maybe even the next one. I'm, I'm starting to plan ahead. Uh, these factional battles were threatening to split the newborn party. And both sides argued that they were, in fact, standing on fundamental libertarian principles. An agreement was reached. Ooh, that was weird. I kind of like bit into the mic. Huh. Wasn't very tasty. An agreement was reached at the 1974 convention. That one was in Dallas between the delegates that while the party would be working towards a society free from the initiation of force and coercion, that the party itself would take no ultimate end game position on the necessity of the existence of the state, and that settling that debate would be reserved as an official policy until at least after, or after at least whatever, a minimal state had been achieved. Some claim that an agreement was also reached that this neutrality would always be reflected in the party platform. We'll get into that. And this agreement has become known as the Dallas Accord. A lot of mythology and false history has arisen surrounding the Dallas Accord from all camps. And I have been astonished that there has not been significantly more pushback, though when you are a third party fighting for your very life each election, sometimes the niceties of history are a luxury that we cannot afford. But entangling this history is how I came to be sitting before this microphone talking to you now. It was, it's been a, a long and winding road. One common false fact or fake news, right? You are fake news. That is often cited is that the Dallas Accord was entirely informal and therefore not binding at all upon us today and that its only use, if any, is as an interesting historical oddity. This is disproven through, and I would say easily, through both witness testimony and a forensic examination. And what I mean by that is taking witness testimony out of the equation, the documents speak to us, the facts speak to us, the history speaks to us. Unfortunately for us, 
many of the persons involved at that time that were key to this development are now gone, such as John Hospers and David Nolan. But one of the original architects of that idea, D. Frank Robinson, is still alive, and I can attest he is still kicking, and he has confirmed my analysis. What gave me great encouragement is that I did this examination and took a took a look, took a look. I'm like, yeah, I guess it is took a look. That sounds kind of weird, right? Took a look at this history, came to my preliminary inclusions. I am just tongue tied today. Preliminary inclusions, my preliminary conclusions and ran them by D. Frank. And he absolutely confirmed my analysis. And I'd like also to, to do another aside here. One of the strangest objections I have heard to the idea of the Dallas Accord is that if you go back into the historical record, you go back to 1974 or 1975, even 1976, that there, the phrase Dallas Accord or an event known as the Dallas Accord isn't mentioned anywhere. And that, that makes me laugh because it, it, it betrays an ignorance of how very seminal historical events are, are, are formed and, and how they, um, it's going to say metastasize, but you know, that's not a good word, but crystallize. The example I like to give is that when you are engaging in history, when, when you are involved, personally involved in a historical event, you usually don't know it. For instance, I doubt the actors involved in Custer's Last Stand knew that what they were doing and dying and everything that was happening there was, in fact, Custer's Last Stand. Like immediately afterwards, that probably wasn't the name given to the event, though it could have been. It probably wasn't. These kind of fanciful names or what they come to be known as sometimes happens decades after the effect. So the, the idea that the day after convention that there weren't articles about the quote unquote Dallas Accord is not at all unusual. In fact, they, I think the great import of it didn't really become as Known, known isn't even the right word. As as impactful, it, it didn't really seep into the DNA of the party until we matured. We were only two years old at that time. We were still worried about changing our diapers, not naming our historical events. All right, just just wanted to get that out there. Back to D. Frank Robinson. He's just a he's he's just a a fount of information. Uh, he had expressed deep appreciation to me that his original position in 1972 that any amendments that would take place in 1974 should have to cross a three fourth rather than a two third threshold was opposed by David Nolan and they decided on the two thirds threshold and. If that had not been done, the Dallas Accord may never have happened. It's that whole butterfly effect thing. History is not of one piece. You pull out a thread and, you know, the whole thing could unravel. And in speaking with witness testimonies, there are some witnesses, let me be forthright with you, that differ with my analysis in some parts. And Ultimately, witness testimony many decades later, no matter how compelling and privileged, can be mistaken and can be biased. So what does the forensic evidence say that we can take in conjunction with the witness testimony? Do we have any evidence for my somewhat astonishing claim that There was a formalization of the Dallas Accord, and here is where the heartbreak I mentioned previously comes in. In those 1974 tapes, the statement of principles and platform discussions were not included. I don't know whether they were never recorded or that tape was missing from D. Frank's collection. He said that is entirely possible. So to answer the question... Do I have evidence of this extraordinarily, extraordinarily, extraordinary claim? And in fact, we do and I do. 
we have an artifact that existed from the time of that convention that was a product of that convention that rings through through this history. It, it cuts through the fog of five decades, clear as a bell. And that is the amendments to the Statement of Principles, which were passed at the 1974 convention in response to that one-time opportunity to amend with less than seven-eighths of registered delegates. And it's to these amendments that we now turn. I will include in the show notes a a marked up color coded copy of the differences between the 1972 and the 1974 statement of principles so that if you are interested, you could see what I am saying now um, for yourselves. And in fact, you may want to go to the show notes now and click on that. So my verbal discussion might be more meaningful to you with the actual copy in front of you. When, when I give this talk live, I have all kinds of handouts. I love me some handouts. So you can go get that. I'll wait if that's what you would want to do. The changes that were made can be grouped into four categories, which I did and helpfully color-coded. At least I think it's helpful. Number one, style and grammar changes. Number two, gender neutrality and related changes. Number three, the Dallas Accord changes. And number four would be miscellaneous other substantive changes. The changes that I highlighted in yellow, the Dallas Accord changes, that's what we will be turning to. And when I began this analysis, I already knew full well that changes made in 1974 made the existence of the state, quote unquote, optional and gave a few nods to anarchy. But until I sat down and did this exercise in a markup copy, which I'm not sure anyone else has done over the past 50 years, they might have, you know, usually when you think you're the first person to think of something or do something, you you realize how very unoriginal you actually are. But to my knowledge, no one has. And it was it was a very interesting exercise. It showed me that I knew actually very little about the changes and that the changes that I was aware of were actually minor. They were not the most important changes. So if you haven't examined this, I, I prepared maybe to be a little astonished and, and pay close attention to what I'm saying because they actually are quite shattering the changes that were made. So let's take a look. You can look at the handout if you have it, or just look with the eyes of your mind as, as I speak. The 1972 version of the Statement of Principles um, contained these phrases. The sole function of government is the protection of the rights of each individual. And government has only one legitimate function, the protection of individual rights. Very typical minarchist statements. Now, the 1974 version changed these and changed them to these two phrases. Where governments exist, they must not violate the rights of any individual. And governments, when instituted, must not violate individual rights. Those were the changes I was aware of, you know, that, that gave the nods to anarchy well enough. So this first striking change is that the existence of government is made optional with those terms, where governments exist and governments when instituted. But the changes actually go much farther and cut much deeper than that. A very subtle but profound additional change was made. And this is like such a libertarian change as well. Like we, we are all very familiar with the, the idea of like, for instance, negative rights and positive rights. It's, it's, it's a sort of, um, you know, navel gazing exercise that we like to do. And this is related. These changes that 
I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm saying wait for it, right, will become relevant when we discuss in the next episode, starting in this one, but I'm going to do an exercise in the next one, which will bring all of this together, uh, the relationship of the statement of principles to the party platform. They are not one and the same thing. And here is the change. The 1972 statement of principles assigned a positive role to the government, meaning that the government was there to do something. It was there to protect rights. The 1974 Statement of Principles assigns a negative role to government. The government must not do something. It must not violate rights. That is a very profound difference that turned it on its head and made peace between these two factions. We'll talk about that a bit more, but I want to answer perhaps some objections or things you may have heard. There are some who will try to make the case that the Dallas Accord was breached or abrogated during the wholesale platform deletion of 2006 at the Portland Convention, which is sometimes in our colorful libertarian histrionics called the Portland Massacre, and thus is of no effect on us today. That is going to be the subject of probably my next research project. My The the two things that have been um, preoccupying me is what happened in 2006, because I think that's another thing where our history has been twisted. And also, what was the original function and meaning and purpose of the membership pledge, the NAP pledge? Those are some things I have on my back burner. But as I have shown earlier, now moving on, talking about the Portland Massacre and the alleged abrogation, this is functionally impossible because the Dallas Accord is in the Statement of Principles. The Statement of Principles cannot be breached or abrogated with less than seven eighths vote of registered delegates at convention. So no matter what happens to the platform planks, the ideological lodestar of the statement of principles has remained untouched and unmolested since 1974. And that is quite simply not optional. And while it is a fact that the 2016 platform, and this gives me an idea for a whole other podcast to talk about the changes that took place in our platform in 2018. Make a note of it. Maybe that will be the one after the next one. So while it is a fact that the 2016 platform stated uh, the prescribed role of government is to protect the rights of every individual, including the right to life, liberty, and property, and I know it does not have the Oxford comma. That's disturbing. The 2018 platform had amended that a bit, and let me flip on over to there. 1.7, I am doing this live. That has been changed to reflect the statement of principles to say government force must be limited to the protection of the rights of the indiv- of individuals to life, liberty, and property, and government must never be permitted to violate these rights. Even going to the 2016 language, that cannot be interpreted to be in conflict with the statement of principles, since the statement of principles is the guidepost by which everything is judged. If there are two potential interpretations of the platform, the one that does not conflict with the statement of principles is the one that is correct. Otherwise, the plank would be invalid, since platform planks cannot contradict the statement of principles per our bylaws. So never can there be an interpretation of any platform plank that would void the unchanging position of official agnosticism about the necessary existence of the state in the statement of principles and can only consistently be interpreted to mean that if there is to be governance, i.e., the use of force, it can only be done defensively and cannot violate rights in its execution, which was made clear in the 2018 changes. However, it is true that the prefix of existing, as in existing governments, was omitted from that plank. 
that did exist in prior platforms. And if there was ever any informal agreement to never do that, okay, that was in fact broken and that would be informal. And that would have been the non-binding portion. It's in the statement of principles. It does not need always to be in the platform. That betrays a serious misunderstanding about the role and relationship of the platform to the statement of principles. But I do think this omission or deletion created much confusion and rancor. And I do think that the platform should revert back to using the language of the statement of principles. But even if it does not, and it comes much closer now, the platform by its very nature is subservient to it. And further, there was only one time in the 1974 platform, the time at which the Dallas Accord was passed in which the word existing was added in speaking of the only proper role of existing governments. And well, Obviously, governments still exist. So this alleged revolutionary breach is spectacularly overstated, but it is used today as a divisive bludgeon, unfortunately. And this is, in fact, in the no state, little state argument. This is a legitimate disagreement. Even though I obviously have come down on one side, I do recognize the force of the argument on the other. And this is probably something we can discuss over time. But this legitimate disagreement is actually so tiny and so far off. The differences are so trivial when it comes to the ultimate goal of all human interactions being voluntary and peaceful that absolute cooperation between us makes perfect sense. And this is where the the metaphor, is, is that what it is, that, that Harry Brown, he didn't invent it, but he helped popularize it, comes into play. And this doesn't work not only it works not only with just strict minarchists and anarchists, but also with classical liberals and everyone else wanting more liberty than we have today. And that is that we are on the same train headed northward. Some of us will get off sooner than others. But this, I know it's a simplistic metaphor. It, this idea is disturbingly being denied by some within the party. Um, it, it, it is claimed that no, it, it's like one train is going to New York and from Florida and one is going to California from Florida and we can't travel together because our destinations are so different. I dispute that. And I think that is a very, very dangerous. I don't mean dangerous. You can have dangerous ideas, right? But I, I, destructive is more the word I'm looking for. I think this is a, a very destructive argument to have within the party. You know, if in fact setting up a very limited non rights violating state is incompatible and functionally entirely different, if a different train from this no state option, then so is any view that sees a bit more state than a minarchist, such as classical liberals. So are they, you know, going on a train to Minnesota so that we should all three split? That is not what we are all about. If we are to move forward and include as many people as possible, we must resist that urge, that urge to purge. But in including as many people as possible in our direction, in this directional view, we must not forget our destination. And our destination is, as the platform says, a world set free in our lifetimes. So with all of this history in mind, and I am using my hands, I'm watching myself and I'm like, nobody can see me, but I'm still talking with my hands. I'm Wow, I, I, I could have been a preacher. So with this history in mind, what does this mean for us today? First, the platform was intended to be transient and potentially transitional. The intention hard-coded into our bylaws was that the statement of principles was to be the plumb line by which everything else, literally everything else would be judged. And that would serve as a bulwark against 
tempering or diluting the end game of the party ideology. This further, however, freed the platform to take softer stands, to take transitional stands that did not deny the direction of the statement of principles, but was in conformity with it, that would not advocate moving public policy in other than a libertarian direction. So people make a grave mistake of understanding when pointing to a platform statement and stating that this platform statement is the ultimate end goal for that was never the intent of the platform. As so aptly stated to me by D. Frank Robinson, one of the heroes of this story, the statement of principles is the star around which any number of satellite issue platform planks can revolve, collide, or be flung away. And our present preamble makes this clear. It states at the end, these specific policies are not our goal. How much more clear could you be? They are not our goal, however. Our goal is nothing more nor less than a world to set free in our lifetime. And it is to this end that we take these stands. And the heavens opened and the angels saying, hallelujah. That is it for this episode in part three. And I didn't know if there would be a part three, but there's going to be a part three. We will take a look at a real life example of how this works with the issue of taxation. Ah, boo hiss. Yay. I don't know. We're, we're, we will, we will take a look at taxation is theft and see if, if that passes muster. So I do hope to see you, see you is probably not the right word, to, to, to enjoy your presence, to commune with you, to fellowship with you on the next episode. And until then, I hope you have an awesome day. Mi guapas de libertad. Thank you for listening to The Big L, where size does matter. Subscribe today and help support the show by going to BigLPodcast.com. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. I must take this time to disseminate the appropriate disclaimers and advisories. If it pleases the crown, while I am an officer of the National Libertarian Party and have in fact sold my soul to the blessed chicken on a stick... <laughs> All opinions, perspectives, rants, jokes, and outbursts of any and all kinds are solely me speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the party. I am not the party spokesperson, just a fanatic who happens to hold a position. Before anything else, I am a liberty activist, just like you. And if you call me a politician, I die a little inside. Thank you.